Welcome back to Murdoch Fitness. This is Zach again with episode 4 of the Smolov Jr. series. In this episode, I'm going to discuss my experience with week 2 of Smolov Jr., how I'm feeling with one more week left to go, and recovery techniques I'm using to ensure I can make the most of each workout. The second and third weeks of Smolov Jr. are actually some of the most challenging, mainly because the weights are starting to feel challenging while the workload stays fixed. The first week of Smolov uses percentages that are just low enough to allow you to recover relatively quickly, given your diet and sleep are in order, and that's pretty much what this episode is about, so we're going to talk about what that means later. But the percentages in the second week are basically week one's percentages plus 10 pounds, so literally you're just adding 10 pounds to your max, you plug in the percentages and crank out the workload. Depending on how you're feeling, your third week percentages are your week two weights plus five to 10 pounds. If you're able to add 10 pounds across the board, that's a pretty ambitious third week of Smolov Jr. That could mean that you started relatively low, um, and that's, that wouldn't be unusual for like a beginner intermediate trainee who is still kind of making pretty rapid adaptations, so it's very likely that they could hyper respond to this program. Anyway, the main point is, is that there's a significant increase in the workload in Smolov Jr. from week to week compared to other programs. And most other programs are kind of scheduled around three to six weeks of percentages that are derived from like one max. An example of what I'm talking about there is 531. The picture up here is a snapshot of my 531 spreadsheet from like six months ago. The percentages for 531 are based off of 90% of my actual max. But if you notice, week one, week two, week three, and week four, all of those percentages are derived from that 90% of one rep max value. In contrast, if you look at Smolov Jr., we're actually using a separate max each week. So we're starting with the 90% of one rep max. As you see, week two is 10 pounds added to week one's max, and week three is 20 pounds added to week one's max. So you're working with three different maxes that are pretty rapidly increasing. I mean, a 10 pound jump is a pretty significant jump. So the rapid increase in intensity from week to week is the reason that Smolov Jr. is such a brutally effective program. Smolov Jr. hinges on super compensation. And super compensation is a response to workloads that cause more stress than a person has been recovering from up to that point. So basically, super compensation is a response to something of like deliberate and controlled overreaching. It's kind of helpful to think about that in an example. So if you're consistently able to recover from, let's say, three days of three by five. So let's say you have a squat, a bench, and a deadlift day, and you're doing a three by five on each of those days, and you suddenly start doing four training days, so you end up adding another day. I don't know, let's say it's for power cleans or something. But your rep ranges for your main movements go up from three sets of five to three sets of 10. So let's say hypothetically you jumped on a program um, after doing the three by five that followed this higher rep structure. And as you continue to kind of work through it um, and you, you know work through a new program a new stimulus that your body hasn't yet experienced in the gym you'll be performing more work than you're used to recovering from so during the course of your training your body perceives this increase in stress and anticipates that it needs to adapt to it pretty quickly and ideally in this situation your body is going to marshal all its resources um, expeditiously over the course of the next few weeks in order to grow new tissue and allow you to adapt to the novel workload um, and this is effectively what supercompensation is. Supercompensation can only occur in the context of a solid recovery program. The three pillars of recovery are rest, nutrition, and we'll call it mobility, but really I mean soft tissue maintenance. So let's go ahead and start with talking about rest first. This is kind of the most straightforward variable in my opinion. I am only training four days a week on Smolov Jr. I absolutely unequivocally need those other three days to recover. This is not negotiable on this program. And for the most part, it's not going to be negotiable on most high frequency programs. When you start skipping rest days, you disrupt a crucial programming variable that allows the program to basically do its job. And kind of honestly, regardless of how you feel, 30 plus reps of benching each day for four days a week really does require you to spend more time resting than training. Don't skip your rest days. 
Additionally, the length of your training sessions is going to affect your ability to rest. I'm trying to keep my sessions under 45 minutes to an hour. There are studies that show that hormone levels drop off after that first hour, but for my purposes, I just find that if I'm working out hard for an hour, I've done a lot of volume and it's going to take me a little while to recover from that. I'm not leaving the gym totally drained. I'm trying to leave a little bit in the tank. So if you're used to going and really hammering out hard workouts, give that a rest if you're trying a high frequency program like Smolov Jr. In addition to actually like resting during my waking hours, I made sure I slept at least eight hours a night. Um, if you have issues sleeping, kind of monitor your caffeine intake. Um, I try not to consume caffeine after four o'clock. Um, that promotes kind of the best circadian rhythm for me. Just get good sleep. It, it's not too complicated. Next, I want to talk about mobility or soft tissue work. The biggest mobility concern of Smolov Jr. is the thoracic spine, especially if you're use a lot, utilizing a setup that promotes full body tension. Creating the necessary upper back and lat tension to support a strong bench setup can create tightness in the upper back over time. And tightness in the upper back will reduce scapular mobility, which will eventually kind of cause you to lose that ability to remain tight in your setup over time. What's following is a series of mobility drills that I like to do for my T-spine, my scapula, and my shoulders. Note that these aren't meant to be diagnostic tools, they're just drills that I've found success with. You might also find them successful, but you need to get a professional evaluation of your needs before you proceed with any kind of mobility pursuit. Firstly, I'm doing just a basic toe touch and I'm emphasizing the T-spine flexion. Um, what I'm really doing is I'm just trying to loosen up that area so I can get better extension in my extension-based drills. Next, I'm doing what's called a cobra pose. Um, this is helpful to gauge how increasing the flexion range of motion in the toe touch contributes to getting better T-spine extension. If you can, if you're warming up, do some toe touches and cobras kind of like back to back and you'll get into that full range of extension more quickly. Third, we have a Spider-Man lunge with a twist and reach. Um, the T-spine and scapula cooperate to help you achieve a tight bench setup with a sufficient arch to control range of motion. This Spider-Man lunge with a twist and reach on each side, it isolates each of those shoulder blades and improves mobility between the shoulder blades and the T-spine. That's really important if you're trying to uh, maintain a tight setup. Fourth, I'm doing a thoracic reach through. It's pretty much the same intent as the previous drill, but it isolates more of the upper back itself. Give these drills a shot on your rest days to address any mobility issues you might encounter. The likelihood of experiencing mobility issues really increases with a high frequency program. So treat yourself right from the start. A good mix of active recovery, which I discuss in my first and second videos, those will be linked in the description, and mobility will keep your soft tissues happy, which will keep you benching. The last pillar of recovery is nutrition, and I really don't want to overcomplicate this. Take your body weight, multiply it by 16. Over or under 200 calories is what you should aim for based on your experience and successful dieting strategies that you've tried. I can maintain a pretty flexible dieting approach. I try to keep my foundation of foods clean but I can eat dirty, I've bulked off of pizza and burgers, and it's been very effective for me, but that's, I'm a mesomorph, that's my phenotype, that's, I'm, a, I'm able to get some leeway with that. But for the love of God, eat, and don't try to cut on this program. That is a bad idea, you will crash and burn. All right, guys, well, that's about it on recovery. I need to go sleep and go eat now. So like, subscribe, follow at at Murdoch Fitness, Hopefully you were able to take away some good tips today and more content is coming soon, so stay tuned.